go ahead and get started and let a few of the stragglers from lunch come in as, as we get going. So um, if you're in the back of the room and having trouble seeing the slides or you just want to uh, jot this down for later to refer back to, um, the slides are available on GitHub. Um, if you hit that URL, you'll be able to um, see the same version, hopefully the same version of the slides I've got here unless I forgot to push my last changes up. So uh, about me, I've, I've been building Drupal sites for um, see just about eight years. Um, I actually have, have an interesting story in that I uh, didn't do it as a hobby beforehand. I actually um, showed up for the first day at a job and they said, we just standardize on Drupal and you're first task is to learn Drupal. So eight years ago, I started building professional websites on Drupal, and I've been doing it pretty much ever since. Um, right now, I'm the director of engineering at Chapter 3. So we've got a big team of developers, and I manage those guys, talk a lot about Drupal sites, uh, spend less time writing code these days, but um, tr try to do some patches when I can. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, Mark at Chapter 3. And I'm MRF on both uh, Twitter and Drupal.org, and probably message me on Twitter. You'll get a quicker response than if you email me. So to start out uh, with a little bit of a controversial statement, um, everything you knew about Drupal is wrong. And Drupal is not a content management system. Despite everything you've heard, everything you've read, everything you've seen, Drupal is not a content management system. So Drupal is a piece of software. Like, that's pretty fundamental. I think we can agree on that. But what it is is a piece of software for building content management systems. So, you know, that first time you go to Drupal.org, you click this link, you think you're getting a fully functional content management system that's going to solve all your needs. And what you're actually getting is a starting point. Like, you've got to start building your own content management system. It, it does probably very little of what you need from, from that download and install. Step. So congratulations, you just became a software developer, wh whether you really wanted to or not. Okay, yeah, question. We're getting a little feedback out here. I think if you get a little closer to the microphone, we'll take care of it. Close. Okay, that's loud. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the opposite. I'll move the microphone away. Is that, is that better? Uh, better before? Okay. We'll, we'll go 50-50. Okay, thank you. All right, so, so we've got a room full, full of software developers, and you can become a software developer now without writing a line of code. So, so with that kind of under our belts, you know, that, that's sort of the philosophy of the rest of this talk. So um, software developers think a lot about complexity. So what do we mean by complexity? So as um, all IT professionals, you know, love uh, Dilbert, we're, we're going to find out about complexity from Dilbert. So he came up with a really complicated project plan, and, you know, he knows when he's talking to management that, you know, they're not going to be able to uh, take his project plan in stride. And, you know, of, of course, they're going to just move up the deadline when they see how complex the work he needs to complete is. So we all have to deal with complexity. It doesn't matter whether or not we write software or we're just uh, Drupal administrators. Complexity is part of our lives. And so when it comes to the world of site building, complexity comes from a lot of uh, different places. And um, it, it's not always clear where that complexity is going to be coming from. So what I did to try to um, get just, just wrap my head around what makes a Drupal site complex, but I didn't really want to go into any you know, customer's projects you know, and, and throw those up on a slide. They might not be too happy about that. So I went to three of the more popular Drupal distributions and tried to do some comparisons you know, from the command line to see what makes these complex or more complex or less complex. And so open atrium seemed to top the charts in all measures. So um, file count is where I started. Now, whether or not file count makes something more or less complex, it really depends on how much code you put in each one of those files and what each one of those files is doing. But you know, setting all that aside, 8,000 files is a lot more than 1,000 files. If I wanted to step through everything Open Atrium was doing, it would take me eight times longer than it would take for me to step through everything that Drupal by itself is doing. And so Panopoly falls somewhere in the middle there in terms of the file count measure. 
Um, this is probably a little bit more accurate for the site builders in terms of um, how complex the site you're going to be getting when you install the Cistro is going to be. So with Open Atrium, uh, just run the install and you have 210 modules enabled. As compared with Drupal 7, if you run the basic install in Drupal 7, you have 33 modules enabled. And once again, Panopoly falls right in the middle with 117 modules enabled. So I don't know about the rest of you, but um, uh, I might know what a good majority of those 210 modules do, but there's a good chance that each one of those modules does something I'm not expecting in, in a way that I'm not expecting it. So when, when you start with an open atrium site, you have a lot more complexity there. And so um, in this, this, um, another way you can measure complexity is this is from open atrium's uh, install page. And so in the install requirements, it's saying your PHP memory limit, you should probably double that before you even install Open Atrium. And maximum allowed packet size for MySQL, we'll probably double that as well. And you know your max execution time, I don't know what the default is, but I don't think it's 60 seconds, so we're going to bump that as well. And so what this is telling you is, like, we actually got some weight with those modules and with that file count. Like all of a sudden our CMS is doing a whole lot more and a whole, a whole lot is happening in every request that wasn't happening before because Drupal's base install requirements are, I think you can do um, 128 megabytes of, of PHP. The packet size, I've never had to increase that for a, Drupal, a plain Drupal 7 site and the max ex execution time could be much lower. So we already know our, a lot more magic is happening. We're not sure what that magic is until we start clicking around open atrium but that site is inarguably more complex than a plain installed Drupal 7. So how do we get there when we're building our own sites? Like how do we avoid creating our own copy of Open Atrium? You know, there's years of time invested in making sure all that stuff works together. So when we're building our own custom Drupal site, like how do we avoid creating that kind of complexity? And so the, the architecture of the site is where we avoid this. So, you know, everybody goes, into every project with good intentions. Uh, this comic illustrates it really well. You know, the best of intentions, this time it's gonna be perfect. I'm not gonna make the same bad decisions I did last time, but requirements come in, deadlines creep up, and all of a sudden you end up with, you know, something that's, it's a usable house. Like, you can do lots of things in it, but it's probably not what you had in mind when you started working. And so, so in the world of site building, um, this happens when you're picking modules. So th this is when you start to build that ladder, you know, build that next section of that house. Like every time you download a module, you're, you're bolting on another feature to your site, whether, whether you needed it or not. So how do you go about picking good modules and how do you go about picking as few modules as you need? So um, I actually borrowed this from a presentation I did a number of years back just saying, how do you, how do you um, interact in, in Drupal um, contrib space? And so there's a lot of information on that uh, project's module page that um, you can decipher to kind of make your module decision. So this is from Views, and we all know Views is an extremely healthy project. And the way we can tell it's a healthy project is three hours ago, Devaner was um, making commits, and he's made two, 2, 000, com over 2,000 commits in the five years he's been working on it. And not only has he been working on it, but we also have hundreds of commits, thousands of commits from other, other maintainers. So this, to me, says this is a very healthy project. This is bug-free or very bug, you know, very few bugs in this code. And I can probably guarantee you that if they find something critical, it's gonna be fixed soon because people are actively working on it. Um, another way to find out information on the Drupal um, project page is look at the number of installs and then the maintenance status. So they, they want more help. It's, it's obvious from this page that there's a whole lot of work going on, so there's probably an infinite number of help, the amount of help they could get and still need more help. But um, the development status is under active development, which means like they're, not, they're still adding new features, they're still fixing things, they're still working on this project. And we can tell it's been installed a whole lot of times, and that number would not have grown as large as it did if it wasn't working well for a lot of people. So that's a pretty healthy module that we can add to our stack, and the complexity is probably worth bringing along. Um, and another thing to look at is how often a release is coming out. How many releases, like have they been working on this thing since Drupal 6, or did they just start working on it for Drupal 8? Like all, uh, there's a lot of good information on this page as well in terms of 
the health of the module you're adding to your stack. So this, this is where we come to special cases. I, I was just showing the information for views. Um, there's a lot of modules that the second you download and install them, your site, like, it, it, just, it just folded on a whole new section the, 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 the minute you turn that module on. So we're going to go through some of those special cases right now. So my, my favorite, favorite from this list is uh, panels. So, I, so, so I've started spreading this rumor, and I don't, I don't know if, it, if it's made its way around the Drupal community, but panels was actually a fork of Drupal. We just never called it a fork of Drupal because it was done as a contrib module and nobody knew the difference. But it has its own display layer. It has a new structure that replaces blocks. It has visibility rules that don't have really anything to do with the rest of Drupal core. And if you look at all those things together, it's like, well, we replaced huge chunks of Drupal with panels, and we do it in an entirely different way. So you add panels to your site, all of a sudden you have this forking complexity. Is it done with Drupal core? Is it done the panels way? Is it done on these three pages the panels way? And is it done with Drupal core on these three pages? And all of a sudden that has to be picked apart by the next person working on the site. So I would say of any module you've had to your site, panels can probably Probably it can add a lot of complexity, but if you use it carefully, you can manage that really well. It's, it's an extremely powerful tool for the exact same reasons why it adds a ton of complexity. So Display Suite, um, it's guilty of the same thing as panels in a, a slightly less, lesser manner, which is that it takes over what usually happens in the theme layer, what usually happens in a module file or you know, um, in a, an HTML a, a, a chunk of HTML in your template. And what Display Suite does is says, that probably wants to get managed in the CMS itself. So then all of a sudden, you have two places to check. Is this happening in Display Suite? Is this happening in my theme layer? Is this happening in my Display Suite theme layer and panels, if we decided to go with the Display Suite panels combination? And so e every time we add a layer, we're, you know, we're adding a new section to that, that house that we had in that first picture. So what you want to do is be really careful about every layer that you add. Is Display Suite offering something valuable to the people working on this site? Do they not know how to code? And having a UI, is that extremely valuable to the people I'm delivering this site to? So you need to start thinking of each feature in terms of, does this bring value or, or does it only add complexity? Like, you know, what, what, what is this feature bringing to me? So views, um, you know, I, I just showed you it was a really well-maintained module. It's a really stable module, but it also has its own um, rules for what gets displayed and how it gets displayed. So it, it, it suffers from the same issues that Display Suite does, whereas am I within the views UI changing the output of a field instead of using a template to change the output of a field? You can do that with views, and a lot of people do do that with views. Am I doing it consistently in views or only sometimes in views? Like, so, so you need to think in terms of that. Is I have this layer of complexity. Do I want to use it? The, the, a lot of modules bring layers of complexity that you don't have to use. You can just use it for what it does best and not um, focus on the complexity. Domain access um, probably escalates this to a whole different level. Um, how many people here have used this module? So what this allows you to do is build a Drupal site within your Drupal site. So all of a sudden, you have, have a, another, another potential um, comple complexity, which is, which site does this feature apply to, and how does this feature apply on this individual site? So is this content type available on this site as well as this site? When I change a field on that content type, does it change the field on both those sites, on all eight of those sites, on all 16 of those sites? Domain access opens up huge possibilities for setting up a really complex, fragile system. So when you add that to the stack, you need to be really careful and deliberate about why did you add this? Why did you architect it this way? Like all those decisions need to be made really deliberately. Organic groups um, is, sim is similar to the ones we just discussed. It um, creates a bunch of access rules. It does it in a really clean, core compliant, API compliant way, but all of a sudden a piece of content is not showing to a particular user and you have a whole chain of things to check before you can figure out why that piece of content's not showing to that particular user. So the question is, you know, is this something I could have done with published and unpublished and I added organic groups, you know, to try to solve the problem? Or did the previous developer who was building this site add it to try to solve a, 
sol you know, is he using this module for the wrong use case? You know, organic groups is really powerful if you have a social site where there's a lot of different users and they do have access to different levels of content. But you don't, you can use it on a site that doesn't have that requirement and add complexity without, you know, without a lot of benefit. So rules, um, I think rules is probably the most interesting case. So um, does, does anybody know what Turing complete means? So, so Turing complete means, you know, basically any um, programming language that's Turing complete um, is capable of solving any software problem. So, so rules is within Drupal and it's Turing complete. So I can build any piece of software possible with the rules module because it allows me to do um, false and true values. So what, what that means is I have an infinite ability to add complexity to my site with the rules module. And you can do all the same things you do in PHP code with the rules module. And it's um, even without turning on the custom PHP filter within the rules module, you can still do a whole lot of unexpected things with the rules module. So I press submit on my content type. I expect it to save the content edits I just made, but the rules module can intercept right there and do a dozen other things, a dozen other, other unexpected things. So um, introducing the rules module to your site should be done deliberately. It should be, I have a requirement that my client needs to go into the UI and be able to change the behavior of things like content submissions. Well, rules module is perfect for that. It shouldn't be used as an excuse to avoid writing some clean custom PHP code that does that one condition. Like it, it, sh it shouldn't be used as a, as a fallback for doing things in a much more clean way. So. Only add it if you need it, and your requirements are driving it. So this, this is what we're trying to avoid as well. It's, it's another, another image of, of what we might create if we're not careful. So, so um, this is, uh, somebody did a scale model of the Homer car from The Simpsons. So I, I don't know if anyone's seen, everyone's seen this episode, but um, Homer finds his brother who happens to own a car company. He lets him design a car and doesn't check in with him about what he's actually adding to the car. And um, the car is so expensive to build, it ends up bankrupting his company. So um, it's got a lot of cool features. I, I, would, I would love a bubble to sit in on the back of my car and a giant horn and you know, a giant spoiler. But those aren't all necessary. You know, a, a much plainer car can get you from point A to point B. And if that's all we really needed to do is get from point A to point B, we don't, we don't need everything this thing brings with us. So next up is uh, data structures. So you know, our architecture, data structures, um, complexity, that's something that software engineers think about all the time. So they spend a lot of time planning before they start writing code. And I feel like with site building, we suffer that Drush DL and listing out a half dozen modules. It's really quick and easy to just start adding complexity really, really quickly. So, so it's, there's no measure twice, cut once. There's a lot of just cut, 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 cut until you have a site that works. And so, um, Thinking about data structures is, is, uh, is, is another spot where I, I feel like here is where planning serves you the best. So what do we mean by data structures in Drupal? Um, so we, we, first of all, we have a problem here, and it's a, apparently the hardest problem in computer science. So we're, we're not alone in trying to solve this problem, is we need to figure out a naming system. Luckily with Drupal, and especially Drupal 8, we don't need to really worry too much about cache invalidation, but um, naming things still is, you know, is a cross to bear for the site builders in the room, and actually more so than the module builders because uh, we're naming a whole lot of things when we're site building. So um, this is how a site builder thinks about data. They think about adding fields. They think about content types. They're, ad they're adding a lot of da data structures. Um, this, you know, normally in historic, you know, software development used to be the, the, the developer. The developer was sitting here writing my SQL tables, they were looking at it from, from this angle, which is, you know, is, is it an int? Is, you know, is it long text? Like, they're really thinking about this in a fundamental, deep way. And we've got checkboxes. We've got autocomplete fields. We can add these, like, we can add 10 of them in five minutes. So we're plowing forward at 100 miles an hour, and we're not sitting here. I mean, this is slow to create this, so you have to be more deliberate about it just because the process is slow but you know, not so with adding fields and adding content types. So th there's a lot of data structures in Drupal and um, content types is the most important one. 
So Content Types has been with us for, I don't know, it was there in Drupal 4, that was the first version of Drupal I worked with. I'm guessing Content Types preceded, preceded um, Drupal 4 by a number of versions as well. And so Content Types, what we need to think of as we're stacking them up is, do they have a good name? Does that name make sense for now? Does that name continue to make sense in the way that content type gets used over time, or should we rename it to make it more clear? Fields, uh, same rule applies here. Do we want to share fields across content types? Do we want them to have the same name, or do we want to create new unique fields for the content types? Do we want to prefix our field names with that content type name so it's obvious both in the database and in the, in the um, content type? That, that field, you know, when we're adding it from a view, we know which content type it belongs to. So as you're adding these things, you really need to think deliberately about the, how the whole system works. A lot of times we fall into that same trap. We're bolting something on here, we're bolting something on here, we're bolting something on down here, and there's no sort of overall like, consistency in, t in terms of what's getting built. Taxonomy as well, um, it can be really complicated or really simple. Um, and it, it helps a lot to have this all figured out before you start building it out. You know, you can, you can fall into the trap where you have two taxonomies on your site, have really similar content, but they differ by like two or three terms. So you really need to think about this up front and you need to name it in a way that makes sense to both the back end content administrator as well as a future site builder that's going to come into the site and try to fix things. Um, menus as well, this is, um, we're, we're storing data and we're, we're, we need to think about um, is each submenu going to be breaking off into its, broken off into its own, own menu to support our theme? Does that make the most sense when you're administering that site later on as a site builder? So you really need to think about deliberately about when you're adding a menu, how you're adding a menu, how, how the menu is named, and um, how it's stored in the, in the database. So because we have the ability to create these things so quickly, sometimes we don't do it in as, in as a deliberate fashion as we could be doing it. So upstarts, um, I, I, I first did a talk similar to this a couple of years ago, and I thought it was funny then to call these modules upstarts, but uh, you, you'll understand why in a minute. So, so flag and flag-like modules have probably been around for five or six years, but um, they kind of changed the way you were able to build Drupal sites. So in older versions of Drupal, like Drupal 5 and before, um, content types uh, were really it in terms of places to store things. So people would rely on content types for everything. And all of a sudden, um, in Drupal 7 especially, we started to get a lot of other places to store things and modules that could, could change our storage module. So flag and flag-like modules, what those allow you to do is just tick an on-off checkbox on that content type. You can do the same thing in a field, but what you want to think about is, do I need to add another module to do what I can do in a Boolean field? Like, maybe not. And you need to think about your own site in terms of whether or not that makes sense. Uh, reference fields. We just got a whole, uh, whole other way to knit complexity into our site. So we, we all of a sudden need to start thinking about, is this content type just a pseudo content type? And does it store data that's only linked to from other content types? And um, you can go down a huge chain of references that require references that require references, and it might take somebody like a couple of hours to unpick all of those deep, deep references within your site. So, you know, it's another thing you need to go into really deliberately and, and think about the storage and is there a better way to store this? Do I even need to reference this content here or can I just have views do the reference work for me? Uh, field, field groups are, is, is another way to organize content. So it's kind of an alternative to references. It's like maybe these fields can be available on this content type and I don't need to reference them elsewhere. So you should be thinking deliberately about how my content's getting stored, how my content's getting used, and um, what's that gonna mean long-term for my site? So um, just to sort of sidetrack for a minute here, the, a lot of the meat of this presentation came from inheriting a lot of sites and just building a whole lot of sites. At Chapter 3, we sometimes launch two or three sites a month. And so, you know, th there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of ability to experiment and see what works long term, what doesn't work long term. And what we've noticed is, is every time somebody tries to save a, a day's worth of work on, on the site building phase, they created two weeks worth of work in the maintenance side. And I didn't, I didn't always, like early in my Drupal career, get exposed to that because a lot of times I built a site for a client 
I said, here you go, here's your site, and then that was it. I didn't really know long term how easy that site was to maintain or not. And, you know, work, working with distributions, working with um, mod modules like panels, a lot of times you can work really quickly in the site building phase, and that's good to a certain extent, but you need to think in terms of long term, how easy is the site going to be to maintain? So um, field collections is another one um, that just um, spidering complexity, once again. Um, field collections allow you to have an entity that's referenced from your content type. So we don't need to store a separate content type. We're going to just have entities attached to our content types. And this all sounds well and good when you're building the site, when you're clicking checkboxes, when you're working really quickly and everything seems to be going smoothly. And then um, three months down the road, somebody says, you know what, we want to translate that site. And you start to realize that the translation interface, it, it doesn't really uh, take field collections into account. You know, field collections are a new edge case. It's not part of Drupal core. And so all of a sudden we have one system that doesn't know about another system and we're doing a lot of work to make the two talk to each other. So we saved half an hour in the site building phase and we ended up adding three weeks worth of work in the bug fixing phase. So you, you've got you to think in terms of that, you know, do I really need this module just because it exists, just because Drush DL module name takes me 30 seconds, is it really worth adding it to my site? So an, a, another data structure, um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about programming, they, they're always talking about lists. Um, so in, in Drupal, we've got our own way to store lists. You know, like I said, Drupal, purely on the site building side, we could build almost any piece of software if we had enough time and enough people with a high enough uh, pain threshold for clicking checkboxes. But um, with no queues and draggable views, we can order the content on our site, we can store that order, and then we can use that stored order wherever else we want to on the site. And so, um, once again, we have information that's crucial to the display of our site that's stored in a separate data structure. So how we use that data, how it's stored, that's all important, and we want to make sure that picking between these two options, that we're comfortable with how it's being stored, and, and second of all, that is it really crucially important, or would a simple, um, you know, that, that promoted field is feeling uh, lonely. It's been there in Drupal forever, and people don't always use it when that, maybe that's all they needed was to promote the one item to the top of the list. We didn't have to add a whole module to add that one feature. So um, I, I had a coworker who uh, did a whole presentation about site building smells. So I wanted to give a shout out to th this um, as, as a way to, uh, when you're inheriting a site, uh, begin to tell you know, what kind of site is it and what kind of shape is it in. Um, this comes from code smells. Uh, pe when people do code reviews, they talk about code smells. So it's like it's this like tingle you get on the back of your neck when you're reading through the code, and you're like, something's wrong here. You know, there, there, there's there's something wrong in the universe, and you start to get this sense of like it's not quite right. And, and so this is people trying to put their thumb on it. Like this this is what made me uncomfortable. This is what made me start start to question the quality of this code. And so I've, I've got some things that allow you to do that when you're inheriting a site as well. So these come straight from our site audit. Uh, we, we do a lot of site audits on new customers we're bringing on um, at Chapter 3. And so these questions come straight from our site audit. And, and we try to use these to get like a, a flag of this needs more attention. We need to dig in more here and figure out what's going on. So the number of vocabularies. Like if, if I see a site with 50 vocabularies, I'm going to start asking a lot of questions really quickly. It's like what what is so crucial that it needs to be powered by taxonomy in here? Or did this person not even know that content types existed and they used taxonomy for everything? So you, you gotta start asking a lot of questions if there's a huge number of vocabularies. And then you start looking into them and you realize, you know, this has the same content as this other one. Did they just recreate this one because they didn't, get, didn't know how to reference the other one? Like, if you start seeing a, a big complexity and a, a big number, it's like you, you've gotta start asking questions. Uh, with content types, it's the same kind of questions apply. So um, how many individual content types are there? If I see a list of 50 or 60 content types, you know, that, that's, that's usually a big head scratcher. Like most Drupal sites I've seen can get by with like 10 to 20, and you know, sometimes you can get by with a lot less than that. Um, and then when you go into the content type, you know, does it have 50 fields on a single content type? 
you know, are they using a module that, you know, controls access to those fields instead of just separating those out to two separate content types? Um, did the lines between the content types make sense? Like, a lot of times when you go in, you're auditing the site, you go into the database, you realize that only two copies of a lot of content types, like uh, uh, only two nodes were ever created for that content type. So it's like, was, did that content type just, was it a relic of when somebody was doing some tests during the site building phase of the project? Um, so, so I'm always asking these questions. It's like, you know, why is this here? What purpose does it serve? Is it even displayed anywhere in the site? Or is it just a relic of developers past? And um, then, then the, the last one is a lot harder. It's a lot more opinion. And, and that's the thing about this whole presentation. There's a lot of strong opinion here, which is that, you know what, like every module I listed in that first um, special cases section serves a valid purpose on a production site for someone and serves them really well. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist, it wouldn't be maintained, it would have you know, died on the vine a long time ago. So this is where you start to ask these like, big questions. It's like, does, does it all make sense? Does it seem like it was done deliberately by somebody who was really thinking about what they were doing or was it done on accident over three years and 10 different developers? And so you, when you're looking at a site, you need to, you need to look at um, whether or not, you know, if I was building this from scratch today, is always like, you know, hindsight's always 2020. But, you know, is, is there a way that this could be done better? Is there a way that I can spend two days right now and clean this all up and make it better for the next person? So, um, c coming up to the next section. So, you know, when you're a software developer, um, documentation is not optional. You know, you're, gonna, you're going to uh, fail your first code review if you didn't provide any documentation with the code that you're writing. And unfortunately, for the world of site builders, it seems like documentation kind of is optional. You know, you're not doing um, standard documentation where you're like, you know, doing a Word doc that you attach to the site. And there's a lot of opportunities for documentation, you know, within Drupal that are also being missed, ignored, um, you know, bypassed. So I'm, I'm going to step through some of those right now. So. Everyone here has probably seen this screen. Um, it, it's rare that you build a Drupal site and you use the content types that are provided to you. So a show of hands, how many people fill out that second massive field on here? So, so we got like half the room and that's probably based on what I've seen, um, you know, what you usually get. So you get a nice huge text area here where you could write a novel about what was in your head the moment you clicked this button and started creating this content type. And a lot of times you're lucky to get one line in here. And you know the thing is, is you're not doing this just for the person coming after you. You're not just doing this for your boss when he's going through and reviewing your work. You're doing this for you two days later when you can't even remember which section of the site you were working on and you know, where you left it because all of a sudden you, you know, you're tapping into your own, own brain from the past. And you know, the same rules that apply to software development apply here, whereas great documentation is gonna make it a lot clearer when you need to work on it again. And you know, every developer that inherits the site after you is gonna thank you for taking the 30 seconds to type out you know, a, a little line of text here. So that's the content type screen. So, Unfortunately, taxonomy gets a little bit of uh, shorter description. You're going to have to wordsmith it a little bit, but you can you can still have an, an, a non-optional field. I, you know, this makes me think I should just write a uh, contrib module that makes all of these description fields required. But um, it, you know, so so it's an optional field. I could probably get turn this into a text area as well. Uh, that, that sounds like a good project for the rest of the week. But um, we, we can still give a little bit of information here, and we should. Anytime we have the option to give a little bit of information, we should provide that information. So menus, we get a nice big description field again, but once again, it's optional. So we can leave it blank, and we can still press submit and never know what was in the person's head when they were creating that menu. Blocks, we get a tiny description. You know, but this one actually shows up a lot. So you know, on that block listing page, this information is hugely important. And if you weren't really careful about your um, title, which you know, a, a lot of times on the title it is being shown to the user, so you don't have a lot of uh, room for you know, exposition there. So that description is the, might be the only way you can actually explain to the person using the site what this block does. 
So use it carefully, make sure it's filled out, and um, you know, think about yourself when, when you're going back to the site and you're, you're being asked to disable the block and you have to click through the configure settings for 10 different blocks to figure out which one to disable. And so this is one I, I was um, joking with a coworker. I didn't actually know this existed, so I'm just as guilty of this as anybody in this room. So in views buried, um, you know, a level deep on that right-hand column is we have a nice big comment section for a view, and we can fill that out. And I feel like more than the content types, more than anything else, views a lot of times are real head scratchers in terms of why was this created, what does this do, which section of the site does this apply to, how come this view has multiple displays, how come there's this other view that seems to do the same thing, but it's not used as a display. So views, there's a lot of things you can write about, and um, a lot of information you can provide here, but it's, this is definitely not front and center and super easy to forget, it, it, except when you're initially creating the view with the uh, builder. So um, to wrap things up, I'll have some time for questions. Um, conclusion is we want to add complexity deliberately. So every time we're going, we're clicking, we're finding a new module, we need to do that for a reason. So we're not adding a module, we're not using a distro, blindly. We're using it because we want everything that it offers, and we're going to use everything that it offers. And we want to name things carefully, and th this is probably the most important, which is um, those content type, content type names, those block names, those field names, those, if, if you're going to not fill out that description, that's the only waypoint the next person has. It's like, this, this was prefixed with the, that name, so it obviously refers to that section of the site. So um, think about how you're naming things. Have a plan before you start creating things for how you're going to name them. And comment liberally. So every time you see a, a text area, just start typing in it. You know, when you're in the back end of Drupal, it's just getting shared. It's not getting shown to the users. But you're just leaving notes for yourself. You're leaving notes for the next developer on how the site was built, why the site was built the way it was, and, um, you know, what you were thinking, you know, what, what, what was going on in your head while all that was happening. So that's it. Um, any questions? Nope. All right. Thank you for coming out, and uh, enjoy the rest of your DrupalCon.